1942 nightmare became unbearable by June. The Nazis had sunk a record 16 ships in five bloody days. Finally, Congress issued a blank check. 200 airships of any type were authorized to be built. It had come at a terrible price, but the nation finally would realize its unique helium asset, the only practical solution to the open ocean search problem. Goodyear's team was contracted to start building a modern blimp and would update the ZRCV for production. New bases would be built to allow airships to range over the entire seacoast of the United States. Since rigid airships were to follow, hangar design was based on housing a 10 million cubic foot airplane carrying rigid. With American steel plants at wartime capacity, a sudden demand for 2,000 tons of steel for each of the 18 proposed hangars, like those going in at Weeksville and South Weymouth, was out of the question. By fall, a Bureau of Yards and Docks team, led by Ashen American, had developed a design 1,000 feet long, nearly 300 feet wide, and 180 feet high. Concrete floors were poured with helium and air supply lines. Rising up from the concrete foundations were 24-foot high footers, provided shop and office spaces. American foresters answered the call as timber was substituted for steel in the largest free space wooden structures ever conceived. The Timber Structures Company was instrumental in supplying this gargantuan undertaking. Massive Douglas fir beams were treated with fire retardant chemicals and joined with ring connectors. To cover the shipping lanes beyond Jacksonville and Charleston, a station was established near Brunswick, Georgia. Miami and the South Florida Straits would be guarded by the Richmond Naval Air Station. The Mississippi Delta would be protected by Homa, Louisiana. Hitchcock, Texas would guard the port of Galveston and shipping beyond the Rio Grande. Santa Ana would cover busy Los Angeles and Long Beach. The nation's Pacific Northwest would be protected by Tillamook, Oregon. At many sites, contractors used tower-mounted cranes. Others used massive wooden traveling scaffolds to erect the arches. All sites had to contend with coastal weather. In the north, snow loads had to be considered. Tillamook was often so foggy and wet, the crane operator and archmen could not see each other. And it snowed there that winter for the first time in 30 years. In the South, hurricane resistance was part of the equation, and Hitchcock was storm damage even before it was completed. In Santa Ana's earthquake-prone country, it was strong desert winds that twice toppled the arches during construction. An army airplane crashed and became entombed in one hangar column. 200-foot-high inverted catenary arches were placed every 20 feet. The arches were supported with an intricate web of connecting trusses. Stairwells led to 137-foot-high catwalks running the entire hangar length. Finding enough manpower was the universal problem. Some of the men building Glencoe came from 300 miles away. The steel hangars at South Weymouth and Weeksville would each be joined by one wooden hangar. But the Douglas Fir plan for Weeksville was unavailable, so a local contractor substituted Southern Pine. Instead of waiting for shop time, the arch components were constructed on the Weeksville site. Homer was in a floodplain, so a levee had to be built around the bayou base. Overcoming poor soil conditions, the Homer contractors completed this largest wooden structure ever built, more than a fifth of a mile in length. At Homer, wooden semi-dome doors 127 feet deep prevented dangerous wind pileup as effectively as the steel clamshell doors and earlier air docks. Seven main meridian ribs 13 feet deep formed the doors, while 17 wheel trucks carried the weight across 11 concentric tracks. 
Eight horsepower geared motors move the office building sized wooden structures through a complete cycle in about 10 minutes. The complex semi-dome doors were not needed at other sites where better soil allowed construction of 147 foot concrete and steel columns supporting 20 foot square box girders. The cantilever spans prevented wind loads from pressing the wood arches as their doors were opened. Six 27 foot wide panels, each 120 feet tall with interleave pulled by cables run by 10 horsepower geared motors. Door cycles took about two minutes and created a little airflow problem. The door design did consume 60 tons more steel than the wooden semi-dome type that would prove more reliable. The distinctive Horton sphere was the most obvious feature of each helium plant installation, but every manner of equipment required by lighter than the air force had to be created in quantity. Overshadowed by the enormous sheds, each facility would need barracks, mess halls, administration, and support buildings. Lakehurst and Moffitt both were to receive two of the new timber behemoths. It would take over a year to complete all these huge support facilities, but each new base demanded brigades of trained men immediately. Pilot training began with practical lessons in aerostatics using hydrogen-filled balloons. Cadets, many drawn from the Navy's V-5 recruiting program, would learn to control a buoyant vehicle subject solely to the whimsy of the wind. They would come to appreciate how a moment's tug on the gas valve or a handful of sand tossed overboard dramatically affect the small balloon's buoyancy. After a solo flight, the student was better prepared to deal with airship engine failure. All this background work was unseen by submarine raiders still plying their trade of destruction on the high seas. When U-432 threatened a large convoy of war material, K-3 appeared. 13, 12 hours, in periscope, airship came into sight, which shortly afterward passed right overhead and forced us to dive deep. 20, hours, dived again to 40 meters on account of airship. The K-type's huge window did allow a wide view, and the methodical blimp could carefully eyeball anything suspicious. Airplanes, which always had to move forward at high speed, sometimes wasted bombs on seaweed or existing wrecks mistaken for U-boats. A U-boat running from a blimp could not train its torpedoes on a target, but convoys without blimps were not so fortunate. Airships acquired an additional mission as U-boat victims drifted at sea. The blimps had begun finding survivors early in the war, radioing for rescue boats and lowering supplies. Soon, rescue provisions became standard mission equipment. On the 7th of July, 1942, an army bomber stumbled on the surface U-701, quickly attacking and sinking the raider. Blimp K-8 from ZP-14 found some of the crew still afloat days later, summoning the Coast Guard to capture the German. The airship, while a beacon for rescuers, could hardly hope to sneak up on a surface U-boat. The K-ships would have to get smarter. A new short wavelength radio detection and ranging, or radar, was developed using K-6. Soon, a second electrician filling the position of radarman was added to all K-ship crews making night patrols practical. Then the K-5 helped perfect an underwater radio microphone. Dropped through an aft tube, the expendable sonobuoy helped detect submarines by their noisy propellers. K-5 proved the microphone could hear a sub at three miles and its tiny radio could broadcast back to the monitoring blimp some five miles away. Rushed into production, the sonobuoys would supplement the short-range magnetic detection gear. Navigation over trackless oceans had been based on dead reckoning until K-2 carried the bulky prototype automatic direction finder, or ADF. An antenna looped around the envelope would help the airshipman navigate. 
Meanwhile, the Goodyear Aircraft Corporation was suddenly swamped with more orders for K-types than all other Navy airships combined. Women came to play a major role in mass production of the K-type airship, the Kingship. Goodyear's balloon room would be Akron's envelope headquarters. A blimp began as three plies of different weight rubberized fabrics which were cemented together with alternating bias. Twelve rectangular doors were joined together fore and aft as stitches were maintained at six to eight per inch. Seams were taped and rolled to prevent leaks, then overlaid with 85 longitudinal panels and end caps to form the K-ship envelope. Workers prepared the scores of heavy fabric patches, cable mounting points, and other fixtures to be sewn and glued into the envelope. Reinforcements resembled a flat hand with fingers extended. Subassemblies were built elsewhere. The Akron Gymnasium was changed from barrage balloons to a thin fabrication facility. The Dunlop Rubber Company also made envelopes. Openings for gas and air valves were double reinforced at the edges, providing an entry for inspectors. Bright lights would reveal any defect against the jet black interior almost as well as the sun did once the envelope was inflated in the field. Air bladders inside the envelope, a French innovation called ballonets, were made of lighter gas type fabric. The layered fabric sandwich only amounted to about 20 ounces per square yard, but assembled, the new 425,000 cubic foot helium bag weighed about seven tons. The world's most unique assembly line, now Goodyear's Plant C, added a second shift to build the airship's core element. Chrome molly steel tubing was welded together into a skeleton containing 11 mainframes. Owl clad aluminum sheets were riveted to the channels, then applied to cover the framework. Diamond grid deck plates covered balsa and spruce planking on removable floor panels. Gasoline tanks and air valves were mounted up above. Pratt and Whitney 425 horsepower engines were mounted on outriggers that doubled as air scoops for the ballonets. The oldest blimp hanger in America was doubled in size as Goodyear started inflating a new kingship every month. Fins were wire braced to the envelope as inflation began. A sandbag net managed the big balloon as workers moved the weights down one diamond at a time. The car assembly was rolled into place and its load cables connected to the catenary curtains inside the bag. A simpler external suspension carried about 15% of the load. In the tight quarters above the car, the ballonet ductwork was connected and valves installed. Controls were strung with tension springs to allow the big balloon to expand and contract without loss of control. Most of Goodyear's original pilots were now in uniform. New company men took each new blimp out for a test flight before delivery to the Navy. Company technical representatives supplied expertise at remote bases. Each location had its own unique problems. Other challenges were universal. Improved mission availability meant more long boring patrols over featureless oceans, sometimes punctuated by line. frantic attempts to chase down Keep and bomb a quickly disappearing contact. Blimp crews longed for the day the when they could prove Outer they had bagged a sub. They had no way of knowing U-boat captains were becoming more aware of their buoyant adversaries. 2000 hours, took bearing on Navasar Island. A Zeppelin stands watch. There was no word like blimp in their language, but some captains were familiar with the so-called Percival semi-rigid airships used in advertising back in Germany before the war. 15, 15 hours, dived, airship, difficult to make out since clouds were of same size. It passed over, a possible, bearing inscription U.S. Navy. We pursued convoy, hoping to service sooner or later. 2000 hours, 
amusement at first caused by appearance of airship or skipping away to a certain amount of respect. Zero, two to the hours, surfaced. No point in pursuing convoy. Batteries are nearly exhausted. Avoiding a blimp was more difficult than hiding from a passing airplane and the kingship posted the most on-time availability of any airborne weapon system of the war. Blimp escorts succeeded in keeping U-boats submerged with their mobility greatly reduced. Batteries would be quickly run down if top speeds of seven knots were maintained. By forcing a U-boat crew to change its objective, a single airship could save many surface vessels, but few people on shore would notice convoy of watchdog duty brought comfort to sailors but would never make headlines or earn medals. Advertisers rarely used blimps to endorse products as they did racy planes or powerful tanks. Then, just as now, people did not realize that a vessel saved from destruction with its precious cargo intact would be worth far more than a sunken U-boat. Our Canadian allies sent an officer to Lakehurst who became convinced his country should operate K-type airships. The Soviet Union, also operating airships, asked for Goodyear blimps. Refused, the Soviets built their own hydrogen inflated version. Back at Lakehurst, the airship found a continuing role as research and development vehicle. Innovators tried mounting a 30 caliber machine gun in the aft window. The expendable weight problem was addressed with the scheme to catch drag weights during a landing, and other tests examined dragging a bomb to troll for submarines. Another idea required a blimp maintaining a loitering hydrophone station using a fuel-saving sea anchor. The old J-4's anchor rig was adapted to the G-1 for promising tests supervised by Lieutenant Frank Trotter and Lieutenant Commander Clinton Round. Rounds was flying some scientists in the L-2 the moonless night of June 8th. Underwater flares capable of exposing a U-boat were being tested. G-1 flew alongside to record the test. Flying without lights, the two airships collided and their entangled wrecks took 12 men to their deaths. Only Ensign Fahey, who jumped clear of the suffocating fabric, was saved. But with Trotter died the driving force behind the sea anchor. Tests on K-5 were delayed for months and its problems were never solved. But many more L-ships would be ordered. It would become the Navy's primary training blimp. Some L-cars were built by the flexible bus company. G-1 had given birth to a new G-series, which became the intermediate training airship. G-type cars were built by the twin coach bus company. The Battle of the Atlantic had claimed 400 ships, but new blimps were now being delivered at the rate of about one a week. In September, near Miami, Naval Air Station Richmond came online. With it came Squadron ZP-21, featuring brand new K-ships 17, 18, and 19. Richmond headquartered Captain W.E. Zimmerman's Airship Patrol Group 2. To relieve the tiny L-ships and aging Army airships at Moffett, K-20, K-21, and K-22 were flown across the mountains to join ZP-32. The old TC-14 was put out to mass testing snow removal techniques. K-ships were being manufactured faster than they could be erected. Every third car and bag was packed and shipped by rail to California for erection in the USS Macon's old air dock. The K-23 was first to be inflated in California. The Japanese, determined to bomb the American homeland in answer to Doolittle's raid, sent aircraft carrying submarine I-25 to set fire to the Pacific Northwest. Slipping past scattered defenders, the aircraft's bombing raid was a failure thanks to soggy conditions, but fear of panic kept authorities from revealing the attack. 
There were about 40 submersible aircraft carriers where that one came from. Finally, the two new Pacific stations came online. Santa Ana welcomed the King 23 to inaugurate ZP-31. Tillamook, Oregon was dedicated on December 1, 1942. Brand new Kingship 31 arrived to start up ZP-33. It would be several months before the new squadrons would be at full strength, but patrols began immediately. Pioneer balloonist and rigid airshipman Captain Thomas G. W. Settle would become first commander, Fleet Airships Pacific. America had been at war for a year. There were only three dozen king ships, while the Axis operated ten times as many submarines. But America was catching up. <laughs>